Without further ado, I have um, Dr. Maxim Mokin, MD, PhD, Associate Professor of Neurology and Neurosurgery at the University of Southern Florida. And his talk is going to be about medical and endovascular management of intracranial atherosclerotic disease. All right. Thank you. Uh, let me know if you cannot hear me. Um, we'll try to make it as clinically relevant as possible. Try to see if I can advance my slides here. Here. No relevant disclosures. So I'll start with a clinical case, um, a real world clinical case that highlights that we don't really have guidelines on the management of ICAD that uh, fit all. And throughout my talk, I'll come back to this case and also show um, other similar cases, um, again, demonstrating this uh, void in, in the guidelines because the disease is so broad, the topic of ICAT management is so wide. Um, so, you know, a typical patient in, in, in 60s comes in with mild uh, stroke symptoms that in fact improve upon arrival to the emergency department. Um, the patient gets an emergent CTA and CT perfusion, and we see a dropout on the CTA of the head where the right MCA is supposed to be. Um, you know, we all appreciate the limitations of CTA. We can't really tell if this vessel is completely occluded or uh, highly stenotic with a flow limiting uh, pseudo occlusion with a perfusion deficit showing this more of a watershed um, type of uh, perfusion deficit. Um, the patient um, was told in the past of a occlusion in the brain. Uh, so he had been treated with aspirin and now the patient is starting dual antiplatelet therapy because these are the guidelines that we currently have. If we are suspecting this is, this is a um, highly stenotic uh, ICAD. In fact, this could be a complete occlusion patient gets an MRI with watershed strokes and throughout the hospitalization course, the patient cannot be weaned off uh, pressors, remains in the ICU, pressure dependent. On a day seven becomes more weak, gets a repeat MRI, the watershed strokes are more prominent. This time the patient is taken for an angiogram, which in fact shows a complete occlusion. And here it's, you know, the response will vary depending on the center where you go. In some centers, this patient will be taken for an emergent intervention. At other places, um, this would be considered a case that is not amenable to an endovascular treatment, considering that it's too risky. It is a complete occlusion, not a stenosis. Um, the NIH is not uh, high enough to justify the risk. Um, this patient gets evaluated. Um, for surgical interventions, and we'll discuss briefly later in the talk um, what are the surgical options currently available. This particular case, we see a very prominent superficial temporal artery branch of the external carotid artery. So this patient gets a bypass shown on the right image. Uh, so it's an STA to um, MCA bypass. Um, the patient has no further events, but remains um, mildly disabled with this uh, moderate left hemiparesis. Um, so the, the case sort of highlights where we are now with these patients that don't fit a typical SAMPRAS profile of a patient that comes in with a TIA or a stroke, gets diagnosed with a uh, intracranial stenosis, gets started on dual antiplatelet therapy on a statin and um, has no further events. Yes, this patient certainly are seen in our daily clinical practice, but so are so many other patients um, that do not fit the profile. And um, this is because the disease is so prevalent. So think about it, um, 10%, 20, 30, 40, up to 50% in some populations. That means that we have millions of patients that are affected um, by intracranial atherosclerosis. So. It's impossible to, to think of uh, uniform guidelines that will uh, 
be relevant to um, all of these wide uh, presentations in our clinical practice. Um, Sunil just gave a talk on perfusion uh, on imaging of acute stroke. I just wanna draw an analogy here is we know so much more about the management of acute stroke and how to use different imaging uh, techniques, their limitations, their advantages. And yet there is still uh, a lot of unknown. When it comes to ICAD, um, the, the, um, I think our, our knowledge is very limited um, and um, there, there's so much more to explore. Uh, a very nice article was, a review article published recently in, in Stroke sort of highlights of where we are now, um, the treatment of ICAD. We sort of enter in the second uh, phase now where there is finally evidence that, um, and the bas again, evidence sort of that and the basket therapy may have a role in certain population of patients, uh, again, proven its safety with the weave registry, but really looking back for the last uh, 15, 10 years, we've learned quite a bit about um, different imaging modalities when it comes to ICAD, and that is something I'll, I'll highlight uh, in, in my talk, in addition to reviewing some of the endovascular treatments that are available. Um, so the guidelines um, are very brief right now. Um, obviously, we have guidelines uh, based on the SAMPRIS protocol, which is dual antiplatelet therapy for three months, management of risk factors, statins, blood pressure control. And beyond that, especially in the acute phase, we really don't know much um, as far as specific management of patients with um, ICAT that come to the emergency department um, and being treated acutely. Um, modifiable risk factors are the ones that uh, we try to treat. Um, most of them, um, Take, take a lot long factors to, to get stabilized, um, whether it's treatment of um, diabetes, smoking, hyperlipidemia, or, or hypertension. Um, and here I'll just briefly mention that when it comes to intracranial vessels, we tend to think that atherosclerosis is generally considered a disease of the intima, but remember that the media and the tissue are also involved and also there, there is certainly an uh, anatomical difference when it comes to intracranial vessels versus extracranial or uh, coronary arteries, which should be considered uh, when we draw analogies with studies um, of uh, carotids or uh, coronary vessels. Um, I, I will not talk much about the SAMPRIS trial. Um, it's been done before in so many talks. I uh, want to briefly mention that the other trial, um, they're using a different stand system. Um, visit trial also showed um, a significant um, benefit of medical therapy over the endovascular therapy. And that trial, I'll get the numbers um, in a second. Uh, the risk of stroke uh, in the medical arm was uh, 9% and 24 arms in the endovascular. Um, arm at, at 30 days. And uh, when it comes to SAMPRIS, um, we should remember that uh, the beneficial um, effect of uh, medical over endovascular therapy persisted um, up to three years. Um, so what I think is critical in order to, to uh, accurately diagnose and uh, recognize the optimal treatment of ICAD is, is to appreciate the complexity of, of its uh, mechanisms. Um, and there's three main mechanisms, um, how a stroke, a stroke can happen in intracranial atherosclerosis. First one would be an artery to artery embolism. So a plaque um, ruptures, breaks off and, and causes a distal stroke. And this will give us of a typical embolic pattern um, on brain imaging. Um, a second um, mechanism is hyperperfusion. So a, a plaque uh, causes critical uh, hemodynamic stenosis and the watershed uh, water zone uh, pattern will be uh, present on MRI or brain perfusion. Um, a third mechanism is uh, branch atheromatous disease. So this will be sort of small patchy strokes in a perforator reach territories such as the mid-basal artery or the lenticular strays of the 
MCA. And um, of course, we can also have a mixed pattern seen at the same time. And this is what makes the diagnosis sort of challenging and sometimes more complex. Um, what I would like to do next is, is uh, pause and review sort of uh, imaging of ICAD that hasn't become the standard in clinical practice, but I think hopefully within a few years, we'll see more and more of these uh, imaging modalities being used, helping us um, sort of provide patient-specific uh, treatment strategies. Uh, one would be uh, using MRA um, um, plaque uh, studies in order to um, better appreciate um, high-risk uh, plaques. So what, what I mean by this is um, MRA that will show vulnerable plaques with um, high lipid uh, content rather than um, with a stable fib uh, fibrous uh, cap or uh, intraplaque hemorrhages, um, enhancement of the plaque on um, the MRA um, and surrounding intima, which will um, indicate that these patients have uh, local inflammation or near vasculature formation. Um, the limitation we have right now is that uh, unfortunately, even if we do appreciate this, uh, this fine details, um, our uh, medical um, management is, is rather limited. So this is mostly a reserve for, for patients that are enrolled in, in trials of, of newer uh, therapeutic agents. Um, and um, there is multiple meta-analysis that, that summarize these findings that's appreciated in this slide. So we have sort of several case reports uh, showing how this advanced uh, plaque imaging may um, help um, in individual patient cases. There was a case presented a couple of years ago where a patient was having recurrent uh, posterior fossa strokes with um, first MRA and MRI done in images A and B, then a second event uh, with an um, MRA and MRI done in images C and D showing new strokes, progression of plaque, and also uh, showing this um, um, high, high um, risk plaque in the left vertebral artery at its V4 segment. This patient also had an embolic um, TCD done with um, um, embolic detection a sequence which showed um, uh, multiple hits as well as a perfusion scan. Um, you, you know, eventually this patient was started on dual antiplatelet therapy. Some may argue that this uh, could have been done even without any of this imaging. Um, I do want to mention um, using this opportunity that there is a lot of uh, limitations in the technology that we have currently available, such as the use of perfusion imaging when it comes to um, evaluating the posterior fossa. Um, we know less about how to interpret this borderline zones or perfusion zones because of the typical asymmetry between the vertebral arteries and so much variability in, in, in blood supply to the cerebellum. Um, Certainly an interesting, I think a very exciting um, area of uh, neuroimaging is, is a functional measure of, of flow in intracranial um, atherosclerosis. So I'll try to spend a bit more time um, on the next um, slide and the subsequent slides to, to talk about the concept of uh, pressure gradient, shear uh, wall, stress and uh, velocities when it comes to evaluation of intracranial stenosis. Um, going back to the 70s, the same concept was uh, applied when uh, studying uh, extracranial carotid disease. So uh, work uh, was done around that time that showed when carotid stenosis approaches 70% is then we first start seeing uh, changes in cerebral blood flow um, in patients. Um, stenosis of 80% or above is when we see um, significantly reduced cerebral blood flow um, to, to the cerebral hemispheres. Uh, around the same time, a lot of work was being done on um, measurement of flow reserve and um, in, in the cardiac um, patients. And really, if we look um, at the work that's been done, um, by the cardiologists, it's, it's quite impressive, their ability to use both invasive and uh, 
non-invasive tools to evaluate patients um, with coronary artery disease to try to predict who would be um, at risk to develop uh, myocardial infarction in the future. So if all, all of these studies, um, both in the cardiac uh, literature and the neurofield could be divided into just two um, areas, the invasive and non-invasive measurements of, of uh, pressure and flow. Um, the invasive uh, measurement is done by uh, mainly using uh, pressure wires. So it's an invasive procedure uh, by itself. And obviously um, in the neuro field, uh, passing a, a wire through a plaque um, is not without the risk. So there's definitely need to develop more accurate non-invasive um, uh, tools to evaluate this. Um, uh, usually the way it's done is that uh, CTA source images are used, they're then reconstructed and uh, special equations are applied in order to calculate um, several measures. One, one of this is a measurement of post and pristenotic um, pressure and a calculation of a, a gradient um, uh, at region uh, post uh, versus uh, pre-stenosis. Um, in addition to measuring a pressure gradient, we could also evaluate uh, shear wall um, stress and velocities. And then um, looking at any po uh, possible association or correlation of, of this hemodynamic um, markers with the risks of um, strokes. So one of the... Um, Largest studies that was uh, published last year is um, shown in this slide, um, a study of uh, 245 patients with intracranial stenosis. Um, so I wanted, to, uh, I, I think the findings are, are quite impressive. So we could spend a few minutes going through how the study was done and what the findings, the main findings were. So um, here, like in, Sam, uh, in Sampras where patients were only limited by 50 to by 70, sorry, by 70 to 99% stenosis. Patients with sort of moderate 50 to, to 69% stenosis were also included. Um, and the primary outcome of this study was looking at a sort of predictors uh, of uh, ischemic stroke in the same territory within one year. Um, what's not shown in this slide, but um, I remember going through this paper, it's quite interesting to acknowledge the limitations of this technology. Um, approximately 20% of patients from this study were excluded because their um, baseline CTAs were non-diagnostic. Either there were heavy calcifications present or um, the degree of stenosis was so severe that um, suboptimal opacification with contrast was present. Therefore, the studies could not be used um, the, those imaging studies could not be used for um, proper analysis. So in, in this study, when patients um, were broken down into categories of um, low um, gradient or high uh, wall shear stress, uh, patients who had both of these abnormal markers present uh, had a significantly higher risk of having a stroke in the same vascular territory within the next year. Uh, in fact, there was a, a almost a 14 uh, and a half, uh, almost a 15% absolute difference in, in having a stroke risk at, at one year, 17.5 versus 3%. 3% were the patients who had uh, neither um, of this hemodynamic risk factors. Um, in the next slide, I'll switch to a different study because I think um, that study is also worth mentioning. They looked at a, a very important, uh, frequently overlooked um, uh, physiologic factor, and that is blood pressure. So here the authors also uh, looked at a population of patients with a very similar uh, characteristics of ICAT, 50 to 99% uh, symptomatic stenosis. But when they uh, performed computational uh, fluid dynamics, they also looked at patients' blood pressure. And what they did find is that patients uh, who had um, 
large translational pressure gradient, but also had low systolic blood pressure for the patients who were at most risk to have a stroke in the future. So it sort of highlights that um, when we have this distinct group of patients with uh, hemodynamically significant stenosis, according to this uh, predictive flow models, um, their blood pressure should be managed very differently than other uh, population of patients. Um, now, the duration of this um, elevated blood pressure, um, that, that's the question that remains to be answered. So should it be days, weeks, or months? Uh, we simply don't have the answer quite yet. Going back to the annals paper, um, I think the two very uh, critical findings that I'd like to point out is that number one is they, they found that all of these hemodynamic predictors, um, the gradient and shear wall stress, um, they're most accurate if you get CTA right away. So if in patients whose CTA was obtained more than two weeks after the event, um, th th there was no longer significance in any of their uh, hemodynamic findings. So uh, perhaps the plaque changes quite rapidly. And um, the, the other finding that I think is extremely important is that look at uh, the subgroup of patients with 50 to 69% stenosis. In fact, if anything, uh, the association between um, computational flow dynamics and the risk of strokes was uh, even more prominent in this subgroup of patients. Um, I probably would be not the only one who hear this, quite frequently um, in clinical practice when a new patient with ICAT gets imaged and the degree of stenosis is not quite at 70%, but more like 50 or 60%, um, we tend to think that um, this is no longer um, a significant intracranial stenosis, possibly asymptomatic, unrelated. So this study proves quite the opposite is that even if the stenosis doesn't look that bad on a conventional CT angiogram, um, it can be hemodynamically significant. And also we should, we should remember the limitation of um, CTAs and MRAs that we have right now. We're dealing with vessels that are sometimes two, two and a half millimeters in diameter. So those calculations um, are often not perfect. Even if we um, use CTA to measure um, the lumen of uh, ICA stenosis, um, you know, and it's, cavernous and the intracranial segments. Remember that the bone covers this uh, vessel segment so much that frequently we get an artifact. Um, so um, we, there is definitely a need to, to develop a more uh, accurate um, imaging in order to calculate the stenosis uh, more precisely. Um, so another case sort of shown um, in, in the annals paper that is quite similar to the case that I started my presentation um, was a, a patient who came in with this, you could argue an embolic looking type of stroke in the left hemisphere, but yet yeah, the patient had critical left ICA uh, supraclinoid stenosis. A hemodynamical studies showed that um, the gradient was quite significant. And this patient, despite the optimal medical management per Sampras protocol, uh, develop new symptoms, repeated MRI several days later, as we see at the bottom, demonstrated this um, watershed territory-like strokes. Uh, also, although you could argue there is superimposed uh, embolic phenomenon presence, so these patients could have both types of strokes. Um, another interesting uh, imaging modality is a 4D um, uh, MRA or CTA it sort of uh, it shows um, flow of contrast over time. So the, the region that is covered uh, with a 3D can, can show us asymmetry between um, multiple vessels. The resolution is not um, superb, but uh, what's interesting is that there, there's, when there is definitely asymmetry between uh, the anterior and posterior circulation between the right and the left side, it can help us um, estimate um, flow and uh, hemodynamic uh, dynamic significance of stenosis. And this sort of indicated with this uh, schematics illustrations, uh, the asterisks are pointing to the area of stenosis. 
and um, the arrows show um, that there is increased or decreased regional blood flow. Um, perhaps important when we try to evaluate how uh, prominent the collaterals are on patients. Um, this summary slide highlights some of the studies that are ongoing. Um, surprisingly, we don't have as many trials um, as I would think we, we should, given how relevant this disease is. And now um, I have about 15 minutes left, so I'll switch gears and talk about the endovascular treatment um, of intracranial um, disease, of intracranial atherosclerosis. The, the, I, the, there's so much variation, so the, the techniques that I mentioned are certainly not uh, necessary what you will see um, at every center that practices it. There was a lot of um, variations in uh, choice of devices, choice of techniques such as angioplasty or stentin, but balloon angioplasty alone, uh, which was first done for the treatment of intracranial disease, I think about 20 years or so, uh, 25 years, um, is certainly coming back. And this is due to the realization that you don't necessarily need to make the vessel look a perfect again, just slight improvement in the degree of um, stenosis will uh, result in uh, significant augmentation in flow. So this technique is especially uh, relevant when uh, there are patients who have hemodynamically significant stenosis and um, the goal is just to, to partially restore flow here. Um, the technique of balloon angioplasty, um, often referred to as submaximal angioplasty, means that the size of the balloon, um, the balloon is sized um, according to the size of the vessel um, and selected um, at approximately 50 to 75% um, of what the normal parent vessel is. Um, the inflation has to be done very slowly and very gentle because these vessels are quite fragile. And if a rapid inflation um, of the balloon is performed, it can result in, in vessel rupture. And also this slow inflation and deflation will help minimize uh, plaque breakdown. So remember this, when you perform an angioplasty or stenting, this plaque has to go somewhere. So either it's going to, to travel distally and cause embolic uh, strokes or it will remain within the vessel wall but it will just the vessel itself will change its configuration um, sort of a, a drawback is that um, the stenosis rates of this technique alone can be quite high and as you can see in uh, images c on uh, ap and lateral views the result is not often it's not that impressive in geographically, but it, 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 when, when the goal is just to provide um, flow, improved flow um, for, for a period of a, uh, of a few weeks or months for medical therapy to start working uh, full strength, uh, this technique is, is extremely safe and simple. Um, stenting um, can be done with uh, numerous devices. So this is a patient that has a perfusion deficit. And in fact, the CTA here shows a complete occlusion of the um, of, of a branch corresponding to the perfusion deficit, sort of similar to the case that I started this uh, presentation with. Um, an angiogram done and confirms that this is a, truly a complete occlusion. So the occlusion is uh, cross blindly with a microwire. Balloon angioplasty is attempted first. However, we can see going back um, on the last slide is that following angioplasty deflation removal of the balloon, the vessel is still nearly uh, collapsed. So the risk here is that if you leave the, uh, the vessel as is, is that sometimes waiting for a few minutes, um, the, the vessel will reocclude or it may happen 24, 48 hours later. So here, stenting was performed um, as a plan B as illustrated here. Um, the FDA approved stent is the, the windspan stent. Uh, 
with the FDA being quite um, rigid on the criteria used for, for stent in these days. So it, this has to be a patient, if I remember correctly, um, ages 18 to 82, patient who has had two strokes despite the best maximal therapy, the patient who has been able to um, recover functionally to an MRS of at least three, and um, the time of stenting should be at least uh, a week away from the last stroke. So very few patients meet this criteria. Um, I'm mostly in my practice, uh, I tend to use uh, coronary stents for multiple reasons. Uh, number one is I really like the, the, the balloon mounted stent um, construct. So it, it, without the need for exchanges, angioplasty, um, able to often precisely place the, the stent uh, without much difficulty. Uh, excellent um, radial force profile in comparison to uh, the wingspan stent. Um, they come in uh, drug eluding and bare metal uh, forms. So the drug eluding ones will dictate use of dual antiplatelet therapy up to 12 months. So that's why sometimes you see patients with intracranial stenosis that are treated with stents and require this very long uh, dual antiplatelet management. The drawback of, of these stents that were originally not designed to be used um, in the neurovasculatures, they, most of them are PMA. Um, however, they're extremely rigid. So a use of an intermediate catheter is shown here um, can be quite helpful in order to navigate the stiff stents um, that distally. Um, in this case, after stenting was done um, for educational purposes, repeat imaging was performed, which now shows patent M2 branch and uh, near complete resolution of the, the perfusion deficit that was seen previously. Um, in some patients, uh, we can go primarily to stenting. So patients with a high plaque burden, um, especially patients where we see that uh, the lesion can be crossed without angioplasty. Uh, in my opinion, balloon mounted stents offer this um, excellent opportunity just to perform one in procedure, not perform angioplasty, exchange, perform stenting. These are the steps that often um, result in um, irritation of the plaque and in embolic phenomena. Um, but again, um, it doesn't mean that this, this is the technique that um, other centers will practice. And like so many other things when it comes to neuro interventions, often the technique that the operator is most uh, familiar with and has done uh, many, many of similar procedures will result in, in very low um, high efficacy procedure. Um, so I'll come back to that in a second. So this is an example of a balloon mounted stand that is being delivered. And um, once the balloon is inflated, uh, the, the stand with a high radial force is able to maintain the, the vessel diameter perfectly. Um, back to the weave trial um, or the registry to be exact. So when the FDA in 2012, if I remember correctly, changed the, the indications for the windspan stand system, subsequently uh, a post-marketing uh, um, registry um, was mandated. So this registry involved um, 152 consecutive patients. Patients had to meet the FDA on label use for angioplasty and stenting. So uh, very similar to Sampras as far as the degree of stenosis, um, time, timing of uh, having a stroke and performing an intervention. Um, the results were published last year, uh, very low uh, periprocedural adverse event uh, rate of 2.6%, uh, uh, four out of 152 patients. Um, had um, rate, uh, that was the rate of the primary event. So it certainly shows that 
with the technique, um, even using the, the windspan stand, that is a stand that hasn't really had any major modifications designed for a long time now, as we are becoming more selective and understand what the right population of patients is. Um, this, this can become a, a highly successful, a very safe procedure. And now there is um, a lot of work on um, new stands, new balloons that are being designed specifically for this disease, um, which given the numbers, how many patients are affected with this uh, in, in the world, there is certainly a, a need for, for devices that are primarily designed for, for this specific population of patients. I have just a couple of minutes to cover the, the antiplatelet uh, therapy when it comes to the, the vascular treatment of ICAD is um, just like with treatment of aneurysm, they use a stance, the, the use of dual antiplatelet therapy here is, is critical, even for balloon angioplasty. Um, although the benefit is that if needed, a dual antiplatelet therapy can be stopped, but it's ideal to perform this procedure in a patient um, that has dual antiplatelet therapy on board and uh, it is fully prepped. Um, whether newer agents um, are any better than the use of aspirin and clopidogrel that remains to be uh, determined um, and also uh, periprocedurally in order to make the procedure safe, the use of uh, heparinization uh, is, is also very critical. And um, I think with this, um, I'm happy to answer. I see there are some questions, but I haven't had a chance to review them. So I'll, if we can go over the questions and uh, perhaps answer a few of them. Thank you. Okay, can everybody hear me now? Unmuted. Okay, great talk. Thanks, Max. Um, I, you know, a, a housekeeping thing right off the bat. Uh, there was a couple of questions about whether these are being recorded. Uh, the talks are being recorded and registered attendees will have them available uh, with a link in email in a few weeks. So um, there were a couple of questions, uh, you know, predictably about patient selection, um, using your first case as an example. And maybe we can kind of, uh, you know, break it down into little pieces. One of the first uh, questions was about the imaging modality that you would use for patient selection. So CTP, CTA aspects, uh, MRI Nova and bold as modalities for qualitative assessment of CBF. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think these are um, uh, very centered, individual center dependent. For example, we do not use MRI Nova. Um, I know that some centers do. Um, we will certainly uh, um, rely um, heavily on the use of CT perfusion if we're trying to understand if the stenosis is uh, hemodynamically significant or not. Um, having said that, uh, we really need literature, uh, high quality literature that addresses how to accurately interpret perfusion in this population of patients. So we, we have dozens of papers that uh, validate CT perfusion use, automated CT perfusion use in acute stroke patients. But I'm, my suspicion is that when it comes to intracranial atherosclerosis, uh, there may be uh, different numbers as far as the significance of asymmetry uh, between, between the two hemispheres, um, you know, relative or absolute cerebral blood flow, Tmax, more than six uh, measurements. What do they really need? I think in a few years, we'll know more. Um, we do not perform computational uh, flow dynamics at our center right now. Um, and, you know, over the last few years, we've, we've changed uh, our vendors with perfusion specifically. And we've noticed that depending on what uh, perfusion sequence you use and what automated software you use, you, you get different results. So I think a lot of that is that we're still learning. Um, right, and, and I noticed in one of the, uh, the cases you had used uh, some neurosynology for emboli detection, uh, any use of vasomotor reactivity studies or you know, do you see something in that direction? Um, you know, CO2 inhalation and looking to see right. if they're dilated. Yeah, um, 
you know, was, we've used to use Diamox and um, I think it's been a while since we've done that. And then mostly because of this very rare case reports that you could precipitate an event but by doing that. Um, now I started with a case that ended up having a surgical intervention. That would be an, a rather an exception um, in our um, institution. Um, however, I wouldn't say that we're extremely aggressive in the endovascular treatment of ICAD. Uh, so we will definitely, the severity of stroke symptoms and clinical presentation is probably what will guide us the most. Um, patients that were not able to win off the pressors that have this fluctuating degree of symptoms are the ones that tend to demonstrate better than any perfusion scan that they are uh, hemodynamically compromised. And most often th these tend to uh, develop uh, worse strokes. So, so you, you sort of answered uh, one of the questions already about uh, the, the threshold that would be crossed for the bypass procedure. So um, we have some questions about uh, the trials. Before we get to that, I kind of want to talk about the, um, the antiplatelet question. So um, a couple of things about your uh, duration if you're doing uh, you know, submaximal angioplasty, for instance. Um, well, we'll still follow the SAMPRIS protocol. So even if a submaximal angioplasty is performed, the patient will be maintained uh, on it for three months. With submaximal angioplasty, uh, we often will repeat non-invasive imaging um, in a week or two. Again, it depends on the degree of stenosis and sort of the immediate angiographic result that is achieved. Um, one thing that I would like to mention, and I don't know the answer to this, but I think what's, what's quite important is how we start dual endoplatelet therapy. So if we look at the, the maximal effect of aspirin and Plavix, especially with clopidogrel, it takes days for the Plavix to, to you know, become fully um, therapeutic. So um, I, I personally tend to load these patients with aspirin Plavix um, on day one or in the emergency department because we see that often in, in cases of severe plaque burden, um, these symptoms happen within you know the next day or two or three. And when you often hear, so what is the patient on? Oh, the patient is on maximal medical therapy, but you know, if a Plavix was just started the, den, the day prior, they're probably not fully therapeutic. Um, so speaking to that point about, you know, levels of platelet inhibition, because obviously that's being tested before you stent someone, but then it makes you wonder, well, if the person is a non-responder, are they really optimally medically managed from an antiplatelet standpoint? Correct. I think that is an excellent point that you're bringing up. We don't test dual antiplatelet therapy on every patient that is on maximal medical therapy. But if someone, even if it's not a candidate for a stenting or angioplasty, but if someone um, is on uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, but has an event, we'll routinely check an aspirin and Plavix response to see um, if there needs to be an adjustment. Mainly it comes to clopidogrel, right? But it needs to be an adjustment of the dose or potentially switch into to a different agent. You know, and I don't think we have strong evidence on how to manage these patients, but if, if, if there is a patient in whom you just see that the Plavix number uh, is so high that you likely suspect that even the, you know, doubling the dose of the Plavix is not going to help, um, it might not be unreasonable to switch to an alternative agent. Excellent. So there's, um, so I, I think we can move on to the other phase of, of the questions here, which have to do with your practice uh, from an endovascular approach. What is the first line approach and uh, any sort of uh, experiences with um, the drug eluding stents or balloon mounted stents? Um, usually, um, you know, I think these patients uh, can be split into two categories. One is patients with ICAD that present with an acute ischemic stroke and they need an emergent intervention, right? Um, they have a high um, NIH, they have very 
well, relatively defined onset of uh, symptoms. And here, um, instead of performing, you know, standard pure thrombectomy or aspiration of the two, I think standard pure thrombectomy could be, you know, a more dangerous approach. You could just go straight for, for angioplasty or stenting. And that will, the decision will often be dictated by the size of their core. So if, if they have a relatively small core and you're not afraid of a hemorrhagic transformation risk being high, in my mind, stenting uh, is, you know, is, is relatively simple. Um, you know, if the patient has a high core, you're afraid that you're gonna give them, you know, 2B, 3A uh, intravenously and have a large hemorrhagic transformation. Angioplasty alone is a, is a better choice in my mind. Now, patients that uh, sort of have a history of a TIA or a stroke a week ago, and they need this sort of semi-elective urgent intervention, these are more complex. Uh, um, I often have a discussion with our stroke attending call um, just to get a second opinion, you know, get a feel of how they feel about this patient, get an intervention or not. Um, the choice of angioplasty or stentin will often depend, and I'll decide that during the procedure, once the angiogram is done, we've seen that so many times that a CTA or an MRA is showing a lesion completely differently than what an angiogram would look like. Um, again, the location of the stent, whether there are a lot of perforators or not, um, a balloon is much smaller profile, so if there is a lot of disease on the entire vessel, just dragging a stent through this. All of this are, I think, the technical characteristics that will make me help decide between the two. So, you know, we have some some questions that I think are, are sort of uh, dependent on the center, as you had said, in terms of, uh, so one, one question was about um, your IV use of GTB3, you know, 2B3A inhibitors, um, uh, which you sort of mentioned based on the case. Um, we talked about the assays uh, and how you approach them. Um, there's an interesting question here about how you get around the regulatory bo board to use a coronary stent versus wingspan. Yeah, um, I think so. All um, well, most coronary stents uh, have PMA approval, so you are allowed to use them outside of the coronary system. I think uh, the issue with using devices other than wingspan is more of a fear of um, insurance companies denying reimbursement for a procedure. Um, I, I've encountered that. I have not encountered insurance companies denying reimbursement for an entire hospitalization, but I've heard of that happening too. Um, I actually think that using, um, in that sense, using a coronary stent is easier because as long as you document why you're, and in that case, angioplasty becomes even an easier way out of it is why you document that an intervention is needed and uh, in a patient who doesn't fit the typical criteria for, for the wind span, um, you could justify using this. Um, if you do use the wind span system, ideally you need to make sure that the stroke, I see this question about the A-day mark, all of these check marks need to need to check because I, I suspect the underwriter, when they see the windspan device being used, it will automatically trigger the red flag and the questionnaire as far as the, the FDA criteria, whether they were met or not. Excellent. And um, so I think now we can get to the, your opinion on the studies and, and uh, the difference between Weave and Sampras and that, that eight day mark. Um, I'm not sure if I have a perfect understanding of what the, there's so many factors that might've contributed to why the results were so different. Um, but certainly by the time the weave registry was started, we knew a lot more about how to perform this procedure safely. Um, whether it's stentin or balloon angioplasty, unless it's an emergent stroke, I think the last thing we'll, we wanna do is do an intervention on a very fresh plaque. So I'm not sure if it has to be at eight days, but at least in the first two or three days, unless the patient is hemodynamically showing new stroke symptoms, it's, it's better not to, not to mess with this lesion. 
Um, I'm certainly not going to comment on the operator's expertise because the centers that participated in Sampras were excellent centers with operators having years of experience uh, in more complex procedures. Um, so I think timing is critical. And also um, whether it was done subconsciously or not, it's selecting the patients. So selecting the patients that have hemodynamic stenosis that is being treated with angioplasty or stenting makes perfect sense. Select, selecting a patient with a plaque that has an, you know, uh, an intraplaque hemorrhage or has a high lipid profile where an angioplasty is done alone or in combination with the stent is likely to cause an embolic event, right? So these are the patients that probably should not be treated with angioplasty and should be slammed with statins and dual antiplatelets. Um, you know, there is still a need to investigate whether this patient's in fact should be heparinized or not, or maybe treated with uh, Duax uh, or some kind of a um, anti-inflammatory um, agents. I, I think that's what plaque imaging is for, is really to tell us what's the mechanism of the stroke and what's the, the treatment that should or should not be performed. That makes a lot of sense. And, and you had a good point about uh, differentiating between the, um, the mechanisms of stroke, because obviously the snow plow effect uh, with perforator strokes predominantly. Um, I think we've done a pretty good job of answering all these questions. Um, Pretty thoroughly. Uh, there was, you know, we can end with this one, uh, and then if, if if the attendees will give me a minute for uh, one more housekeeping thing. But um, uh, you know, this came up early. Here's a hypothetical scenario: a patient comes in with severe ICAD, comes in with an NIH of six, CTA shows a distal M2 occlusion in addition to severe ICAD bilaterally. In an acute setting, how accurate is a CTP in predicting the penumbra? My intuition is the the exam is going to be key here, um, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, don't don't we hate an age of six? <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, right. It, it would have been much easier if it was sixteen. Um, I, I personally, I loved Sunil's um, presentation on the role of perfusion, and I do agree that in a lot of cases, perfusion is not needed. I think in in patients with a low NIH or with with ICAD uh, specifically, this is an imaging modality that, that could be helpful because it, it may show us whether this stenosis is causing the symptoms or not and whether it's worth uh, doing it. Uh, I certainly find this to be very challenging, this mild, mild symptoms with diseased vessels. I think it's a judgment call, so many factors, patient's age, heart, this is the case where a, a thorough discussion with the patient and the family should happen. Yeah. So um, I think that we have around five more minutes, um, but I think we're pretty much all set here. Um, Max, is there anything that you, you happen to see on the side that I didn't get to answering? No, uh, I think you covered it. Great. So uh, thanks again, uh, Dr. Mokin, for that great